Hello, everyone. My name is Yasmin. Okay, so this is the slide. This is the slide. <laughs> this is the topic that I'm going to be talking about today, which sounds like a very strange title, but um, it's a it's a very cool story, and it's the story of Swatch: How a Lebanese Guy Helped Save the Swiss Watchmaking Industry. How did I get here? So it started off, I was um, trying to think of a topic for my forward and I was thinking of things around Lebanon, which is where I'm from. And I was like, maybe the egg could be a cool topic. And the egg is this uh, structure, which is in the heart of Beirut, was half uh, destroyed during the civil war, never rebuilt. Uh, while I was reading about it, I saw that the architect was a, a man called Joseph Karam and he was married to a woman called Nayla Hayek. And I was like, well, I mean, Sorry, Mona Hayek. And I was thinking, okay, you must be a very famous woman for to be included in any bio about your husband. Like, oh, he's married to Mona Hayek. So I was like, who is Mona Hayek? Um, and turns out she's Nicola Hayek's sister. And then I learned that this is Nicola Hayek, the founder of Swatch Group. So <laughs> that's the Lebanese guy who helped save the Swatch, uh, Swiss watchmaking industry. Uh, kind of surprised he was Lebanese, to be honest. I was pretty sure he was Swiss. Um, and I mean, this, the Swatch Group is a very Swiss company. I mean, they pretty much have the, um, the flag in their logo. Um, but he is uh, very much celebrated for his pivotal involvement in reconstructing the Swiss watchmaking industry. I'm going to tell you how, but before I do, I'm just going to uh, talk a little about my source. So forwards are uh, typically predicated on uh, a single source, which is very rich. And this article was mine by a guy called Joe Thompson. If, so if you are interested in watches or you love the world of watchmaking, this guy, you have got to read his articles. Um, he's been, he has over 40 years of editorial experience and his, he's considered like the gold standard of watch journalism. So a good guy to keep your eye on if you wanna if you're interested in watches. Um, you know he was he was previously the editor. Um, he used to work he used to write for Bloomberg. He's written for New York Times, Forbes, BBC, The Works. Um, and Swatch started a revolution. Is this is a great article which you should all definitely read. But there was a revolution before Swatch came on the scene, and that was. Um, the Protestant Reformation. So to start off with, how did, how did, like, how did Swiss, Switzerland and watchmaking become so uh, intertwined? And why is that such a huge part of the Swiss uh, industry? I'll tell you why. Um, there was a, the Protestant Reformation happened in like the 15th and 14th century. And a lot of it was driven by uh, puritanical reform. And what that means is that there were, um, Protestants really felt that Catholics and Catholicism have, had really moved people very far away from the core of Christianity, which is, you know, focusing on the scripture and focusing on your faith. But instead they had, um, you know, that there was so much uh, wealth and riches in the Catholic Church, and you can hear, see here, there's a very, it's very easy to see the difference between a Catholic Church which is in the top image, which is so ornate. You have plenty of imagery, you have stained glass windows, um, just beautiful architecture. And then the bottom one, you have a Protestant Church, which just barely has pews for people to sit in. Um, and that's just like a very sim simplistic, highly reductionist way of showing the difference between um, you know, churches which belonged to the Catholic era prior to Protestant Reformation. Now, there was a guy called John Calvin. John Calvin became a leader of the movement in Switzerland. Um, and he, um, one second. Yeah, he was a leader of the movement in Switzerland and he said, okay, jewelry is not a thing anymore. We will no longer make jewelry, it's not allowed. But you had this entire uh, group of jewelers or, and jewelry makers who found themselves in a bit of a problem because they're like, this is my livelihood. What do you mean I can no longer do that? Um, so what, he, what they agreed is that people could, they could make watches. So they took all this skilled craftsmanship and applied it to watchmaking. And the reason for that, that watches were allowed to be produced and sold is that they were considered um, a, a practical instrument. It's something that you need to be able to tell the time. It's not something that, you know, is a marker of wealth or prosperity. Now, what's ironic is that the suppression of 
uh, ostentatious jewelry led to a, a highly valuable and um, prosperous industry in, in Geneva, which is watchmaking instead. So what's Nicola Hayek got to do with this? Um, Nicola Hayek was just a student in AUB, which is also my alma mater. So I was like, oh, great, great people have graduated from this university. Um, and he met while he was studying a nice uh, Swiss lady called Marianne Mesger. And they fell in love and they married in 1951. And they moved to Switzerland, which was her, her home country. And while in Switzerland, he set up a management consulting firm uh, called Hayek Engineering. So the, the role of this consulting firm was to set to uh, implement successful turnarounds of businesses. Any businesses that weren't doing very well would come to them. And then he would kind of help them figure out how to go from being in the red to turning a profit. Okay. Now, two companies were in that situation in the 80s. Uh, there were two Swiss watchmaking companies which were in turmoil, like they were not doing well. And to be honest, the entire industry wasn't doing well. And there's a reason for that. Seiko um, was killing it with the revolutionary quartz technology. And quartz technology is um, a technology which, which is uh, mechanical, it's automatic, and it's more accurate than uh, the traditional wristwatch, and it's also cheaper to produce. So all of these consumers, I mean, if you guys had a Casio watch or a Seiko watch in the 90s and 80s, you, you, you probably um, can relate to this. They were, they were dominating globally. And Swiss watchmaking, which was very detailed and very, um, you know, uh, luxurious, was no longer as, as in demand when people could get a cheaper and more accurate watch. So these two Swiss watchmakers, Swiss watchmaking firms, this is going to happen often, by the way. Uh, Swiss watchmaking firms came to uh, Hayek Consulting, uh, Hayek Engineering, and said, oh, we need to help, you need to help us oversee the liquidation because these two companies are going broke and we just want to, that's it, They're gonna, we're going to close shop. But Hayek took a very long look at these two companies and he identified lots of problems in their products, their policies, their distribution, and mostly in their leadership. He felt that their leadership was very outdated and needed to be changed, like completely overhauled. So instead of liquidating the two companies, he decided to propose a merger. He said, okay, I'm gonna take these two companies, put them together, and I think they'll do well. And then he, that was the company which um, he created, which had a very long name. And this is something that came, will come up later. But their society, and bear with me here, uh, what their, sorry, their name was Société Suisse de Microélectronique et d'Horlogerie. SMH for short. <laughs> Try saying that without getting your tongue um, in, a, in a knot. So Hayek decided, okay, this isn't working, but I see something that can be done here. So he, uh, you know, just completely revamped the management leadership. And he even took a look at how the watches are made. So this guy goes into the details of the details. And he found that the traditional wristwatch um, requires nearly 100 parts to make. And he was able to devise the, uh, a way to make a watch which worked just as well, which only required 51 parts, which is a sw the Swatch watch. And it didn't compromise accuracy or quality. And so it was cheaper to make which means it was cheaper to sell, which means that more people could buy a watch, but more people could also buy several watches. So as you know, they was able to turn a profit and not only to turn a profit, but it actually did incredibly well. Now, aside from the, the logistics of the Swiss wa of the watchmaking and the distribution, he also was an enormous believer in the power of marketing and advertising. Um, and one of his greatest successes with successes is turning the uh, watch industry on its head by delinking the watch from its timekeeping function. Everyone knows you wear a watch to tell the time, but not anymore. According to Hag, he's like, no, no, guys, that's not the point of a watch. The point of a watch is a fashion accessory. It is supposed to enhance your look and um, something that you think, okay, what is the occasion that I'm going to and what is the watch that goes with it? And he was able to do this by, you know, rolling out a bunch of really cool and kind of outrageous designs with Swatch. I mean, you guys know when you walk into a Swatch store, there's like a thousand and one different options. They're crazy, they're colorful. You have, you know, in the top left, 
left corner, the uh, Keith Haring watch. Keith Haring was a, a prominent street artist in, in New York. Um, you have at the bottom a bunch of really colorful and, and, and distinctive styles. And then in the top right corner, and this is the one that I just love, you have, you have this guy called Alfred uh, Hoff Kunst, who um, created a collection which was consisted of three watches, which were designed to resemble a cucumber, a chili pepper, a bacon, and eggs. <laughs> and this is carried in upscale food stores only and sold out in three hours. So, I mean, this guy just went ham. No, no pun intended. He just went ham with the designs. Like, do it all, do it, do everything you can. So it wasn't long before you had these fashion brands that were just lining up at the door to also have their version of the Swatch Watch. So what kind of Swatch Watch would, would they design? Um, and this, this phenomenon called Watch Wardrobing um, was just created an enormous sales boom. Uh, fashion designers, uh, any kind of designer actually could design their own watches. And the watch itself was so affordable, thanks to the changes you've made that we talked about before, that you could have, it would allow you to have repeat purchase. And one of their taglines was a swatch for a season, not a watch for all seasons. And that's some good copywriting. So, Hayek uh, spearheaded the reorganization of these two companies, the, the SMH for short, for four years. And then he finally brought about their merger. Um, and in 1998, this is, so this is, he became the uh, chairman and CEO of Swatch Group in 1985. Uh, but in 1998, he decided to do something that was a little controversial. So by this time, uh, the group had become, or SMH had become very large and started buying out these big luxury brands. Uh, between them, you have uh, Blancpain, Omega, Longines, uh, Tissot, uh, Calvin Klein, Bruguet, and even more. And you're thinking, Swatch, the modest little swatch that I had as a teenager owns all of these brands, like brands that are so great that they can have Ashwarya Rai as the face of the company uh, or as the face of the brand. And Joe Thompson, the guy who wrote the article, had, had a bit of a disagreement with uh, Nicola Hayek about that. He said, I think it's not a good idea to take a company that, that owns all these luxury brands and name it after a plastic wristwatch that cost $45. But Nicola Hayek did it anyway, and obviously it worked out fine. <laughs> He passed away in 2010, and at the time he was the world's 232nd richest person, um, which sounds like very far down the list, but let me tell you, it's a sizable sum of money. Uh, his children, Nicola, and Nicola Jr. and Neila now control the group. Um, and I think, you know, his, his, his legacy is very much lasting based on the fact that, you know, you have the four uh, most valuable luxury brands, Louis Vuitton, Hermes, Gucci, and Chanel, have their, make their watches in Swiss factories and Geneva's watchmaking for uh, Geneva and Switzerland in general continues to be a very lucrative business. Um, yeah, and, and one of the nicest, this is a really great interview which you could also watch with him, uh, which is in German. And one of the things that he was known to repeat is that the rarest resources are entrepreneurial types and top management. And I think that's that's one of the things that Nicola Haik really represented, someone that like really uh, sees something in a completely different way, is able to convince the whole world uh, of his way of seeing things and then build a lasting legacy. So that's something that, you know, you could remember the next time you look down at your watch. These are two really cool articles. Uh, uh, sorry, the first one is an article by Joe Thompson, the, the same author who wrote the article that um, you saw up front. And the second one is also a really cool book that really delves into the history of the Swatch uh, group. This Great. is me. 